Welcome back. You're watching uh, CNBC Africa. We are live like we've been promising uh, for the whole day. We will be joined for the next 30 minutes for a special with uh, Professor Benedicto Rama, President of the African Export and Import Bank. Also joining the conversation is my colleague Ken Ibomo from uh, Lagos. Gentlemen, thank you. Prof, thank you for coming through and chatting to us today. We thought since we had the official launch of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area at the 1st of January this year, it was important that we look back and we see the bottlenecks that may be holding up the really important work of increasing intra-African trade. But we also thought at the same time, given the big role that you are playing yourselves in ensuring that we are able to open up the continent for trade, we talk to you about those efforts and where they are going. So let's begin right there and talk about this very important work because you can't have trade without people because we know the disruption that's been caused. What has the bank done and what do you see in terms of the ability of the continent to reopen for trade going forward? Thank you very much, Godfrey, and thanks to uh, uh, Ken and all, all our friends at CNBC. Um, the problem the, the world and, of course, the continent of Africa faces today um, is because we have the pandemic, which uh, has become the main challenge to open our economies, to uh, exploring all the opportunities for our businesses. So for us to get out of the economic challenges, we have to first deal with the virus. And dealing with the virus um, means uh, that we have to uh, work on something that will uh, permanently put it away. And scientists say that vaccines offer us that opportunity. And that is why Afrexim Bank is doing all it can to support the African Union agenda to vaccinate our people. The Africa CDC um, has recommended to the African Union that Africa will need to vaccinate at least 60% of its population to achieve herd immunity and, and to be able to put uh, the virus away from the continent. Hmm. Otherwise, we'll be having episodic uh, breakouts, uh, outbreaks of these uh, diseases, and we will be um, closing our economies intermittently. Uh, and the 60% is absolute min minimum, and uh, it's a function of perhaps the efficacy of vaccines. Hmm. So um, uh, what is the African Union doing about it? The African Union, um, under uh, President Ramaphosa, when he was then the chair of the African Union, mm. set up the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team, of which I a member by virtue of my position as a chairperson yeah. of the African Union COVID-19 Response Fund. Uh, that uh, task team, called the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team, AVAT, uh, was mandated to find vaccines in a tight market, uh, complement the vaccine supplies expected from the Gavi Kubax facility. Uh, it was also then expected to estimate the cost of uh, procuring the vaccine and to raise the financing to make it possible for our countries to yeah. be able to procure the vaccines. Mm. The Gavi Kubax facility um, at inception promised to deliver uh, vaccines enough to vaccinate 50% of the population of the country. Mm. It means that we have 40% uh, yet to be accounted for. So what we did as members of the ABAT was to uh, go out to look for those vaccines. Right. Um, by January, we had um, gotten uh, uh, provisional offers for 270 million doses of those vaccines. Yeah. Uh, a total cost of about $1.86 billion. Uh, so what we then did uh, was, uh, as members of our VAT, to work with our present bank uh, to uh, put that facility in place. And I can uh, uh, inform you here that the African present bank board of directors have approved an amount of $2 billion to support the procurement of those vaccines. Sure. 
and that Fraser Bank is working to bring in uh, uh, to be able to increase that amount because the 270 million doses will only account for 15 percent of the population. Right. So if you add it to what the Gavi will deliver, uh, we're talking of uh, uh, being able to vaccinate 35 to 40 percent of our population. We still have 20 percent to vaccinate. So we need to get more money. We need to uh, find more vaccines uh, um, from around the uh, uh, from those candidate vaccines that we are targeting. But I can assure you uh, that we are doing all we can to make sure we find those vaccines. We are doing all we can to make sure we get uh, the finances to make it possible for us to acquire those vaccines. De definitely interesting work you are doing there on getting the vaccines on board. But then as we get into trade, and we're happy to see that the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is finally on board. So I'd like you to speak on what um, the African Bank is doing around payments. I understand that the Pan-African Payments uh, Settlement System is currently, on, uh, is, uh, is currently in the works, and we understand that, that we're seeing progress in di from different countries. Can you, can you speak to the work that is going to do to, uh, to advance trade on the continent? Uh, yes, uh, as you know, um, the political act of signing the uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is, uh, is a precondition to what we want to achieve. Agreement. It's a necessary condition. The sufficient condition uh, is making sure that trading actually takes place, that countries participate. Um, and there are a number of things uh, uh, that will have to be done to make that possible. Uh, and the FCFTA Secretary, which has been set up and uh, being run uh, by the Dynamic Secretary General, so one, Kelly Mene, is addressing all those uh, issues, addressing them with the force of a hurricane, I would say. Um, one key element there is the payments, as you mentioned. Uh, we know very well that because we have 55 economies, I think we have about 40-something uh, currencies, um, what that has done for us is that it has contributed in direct trade from outside the continent. And the trade that would normally um, would have occurred were diverted because uh, uh, look out to go and, and the trade to... Um, and foreign currency to be able to pay for goods that they will buy from just across the border. Uh, apart from that, uh, we also know that the cost of um, the today's arrangement of payment to Africa is about $5 billion. And sometimes to transfer money from one African country to the other takes between one week to even two weeks. Sometimes uh, it never gets there. There are a myriad of problems we face today, all increasing the cost of doing business amongst ourselves, restraining uh, business, diverting trade. Uh, so the, uh, a payment system that makes or helps us to deal with all of this is critical in making sure that we commence trading. It is critical in bringing to life uh, the, our creative economies. So what we've done uh, is under the auspices of, auspices of the African Union, uh, we are working with the African Union and the AFCFTA Secretariat to put in place a Pan African Payment and Settlement System uh, called the PAPS. That system uh, has been designed to make it possible for Africans to pay for intra African trade in goods and services in their national currencies. So, what it means is, is that. Um, Somebody in Nigeria, where you are, um, wanting to buy something from South Africa, does not have uh, to go look for dollars or euro or whatever yeah. uh, to pay the South African. Uh, and then when he gets to South Africa, the South African who is exporting it then gets it in rent. Mm. Uh, the way it works today, once we once we start in about two three weeks, uh, is that the, the Nigerian will pay in, for those goods in naira. And the South African exporter will get uh, the rent. Uh, we think this will be a game changer uh, for trade uh, on the continent. Because it will make it possible for a small um, a, a farmer, even in Angola, uh, who has a telephone, to buy Nollywood uh, film in Nigeria yeah. uh, uh, online 
without having to go uh, to look for a credit card that uh, make it possible for him or her to pay for this in uh, in foreign currency. Yeah. That person would just simply buy uh, uh, get get access to the streaming service by paying in Angolan kwanza, and the the, the the producer in Nigeria would get naira. Yeah, indeed, so it sounds like a game changer, uh, Prof. No question about that. Sorry to come in there. I wanted to quickly follow up on that question, Prof. You say it's going to come online in two to three weeks. I wanted to know two parts to, 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 to uh, that point. One, how many countries have you been able to get to commit to this to use it? And then secondly, I wanted to know your thoughts. If you think there's space within the payment system, for digital currencies in my in the groups that i belong to there's been a lot of chatter about bitcoin and digital currencies and replacing the fiat currencies etc etc so uh, first of all we are going to start the piloting well our target for starting the piloting is towards the end of march uh, and the piloting is the, uh, we start in the west african monetary zone countries uh, and we chose the West African Monetary Zone countries because they represent the continent of Africa. You have six countries there. Uh, one of them um, uses the uh, uses French, others use the English language. You have the large economies. You have Nigeria, which is very large. You have the very small, the smaller economies uh, like Gambia. Uh, and all the six economies use six uh, currencies. So anything that, that can go wrong, that will go wrong, will go wrong there. Mm -hmm. So that is why we are piloting it first there. So we learn uh, from experience whatever happens, we correct it there before then we start rolling it out. So our expectation based on the timelines we have is that we will start the piloting by towards the end of March. So let me go to the Bitcoin issue and the cryptocurrencies. I think this is something... Um, uh, the different monetary authorities are dealing with in their own uh, jurisdictions. Uh, I cannot comment on that. I cannot comment on that because um, uh, the payment system, the PAPS, is actually going to be regulated by the uh, by the central banks. Uh, they will determine whether, uh, at some point, uh, they will allow uh, whatever uh, currencies. Uh, can get it there. So um, I would I would uh, defer to uh, the central banks about how that happens. All right. No doubt, President Rama, that the trade and trade ecosystem in Africa still needs uh, a lot of work, especially around financing and infrastructure. But I'd like you to uh, speak to how we can achieve the desired outcomes and what the role of the Fund for Export Development in Africa is going to play in all of this. Well, the, the, uh, the Fund for Export Development in Africa is a, is, a, is a fund we created in 2018. And we created it because uh, we looked at the space uh, for financing um, exports on the continent. Uh, we know that we and a couple of other uh, banks, uh, uh, multilaterals, are supporting and uh, providing debt uh, in that direction. Of course, um, uh, every day we do advance for debt, we see uh, companies that we are not able to support because they are undercapitalized. We see great opportunities to support our SMEs in dynamic sectors, but we are not able to do that because the companies do not have the equity to, um, to make it possible to access uh, debt financing. So that's why we created the fund. And in creating the fund, we didn't want it to be like the usual private equity funds uh, that are looking for uh, certain kinds of very, very high returns yeah. uh, and also uh, that are not that patient. So we created this fund to be patient and also to, uh, to be aiming for reasonable returns, but more importantly, for it to be an impact fund. So its target is to support um, value-added activities support SMEs who will, who will be operating in supply chains, uh, manufacturing. Yeah. The only infrastructure we'll be supporting will be infrastructure that will promote to, like the industry. Uh, we think the continent needs that. Unless the continent is able to uh, have 
that Christian capital. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we will not be able to use that only uh, to create the dynamic um, uh, export economy we need. We will not be able to create the kind of activities that will be driving uh, regional supply chains under the LCFTR arrangement. Yeah. The importance of it in the context of developing Africa's infrastructure and saying that we need to have more conversations around what it is and what it could do potentially for us. But I wanted to follow up very quickly on uh, the Export Development Fund. I wanted to talk about Tech Hub, where you have seen uh, it coming from and whether you have seen other areas dominating over others and you have had to step in to make sure you fix that. I'll pick up the other question after, uh, after you have answered that one. Uh, well, um, the... Uh, first of all, where, where are we with this fund? Uh, because that's very important. Uh, the fund um, uh, has been set up as an international organization. Um, the reason we set it up as an international organization is to make sure that it benefits from the privileges and immunities our present bank currently has. Um, so the headquarters uh, of the fund will be in uh, Rwanda. We have already signed the headquarters agreement with the government of Rwanda, so the fund will be headquartered in Kigali. Um, we've also then had the government of um, Rwanda sign the establishment agreement, the government of Mauritania has signed the establishment agreement. And the number of countries that are now considering to sign the establishment agreement. Um, but beyond having uh, to do all these establishment issues, we already have the team in place and already doing uh, transaction. Uh, what we are seeing um, is that in the sector that the, um, the entity is focused on, there is a huge demand. I think they have a pipeline today of more than $1 billion for transactions that they need uh, to support. And this is cut across um, uh, process of manufacturing, uh, in uh, food processing, yeah. uh, even uh, some fintech businesses with that, with that they are looking to support, yeah. and of course, also um, trade enabling infrastructure, that is industrial yeah. uh, park projects. There have also been uh, some um, uh, projects in the uh, medical area, uh, especially following what has happened with the COVID-19. Mm. There's been uh, some optic in interest in um, amongst Africans to put up uh, um, pharmaceutical facilities and also hospitals. Yeah. So I'm saying wherever you are in Africa, there you go. There is an export development fund that's waiting for you to apply uh, at uh, the Africa Export Import Bank. Prof, one more question from my side, and this is on uh, the beginning, of course, of trade under the AFCFTA. I wanted to know if you have had any anecdotal evidence of how this has been going on, i.e. from the take up of funds from within your own bank and the projects that you fund, or perhaps stories that you share with other CEOs about whether companies have been able to actually trade under the terms of AFCFTA? Well, okay. Um, we'll get to, let me start with the other one about interregional trade. What I can tell you is that interregional trade uh, is, uh, is growing rapidly. When the results come out uh, about uh, the statistics, of what must have happened last year. Uh, you will find that despite uh, the borders that uh, we are shut down uh, temporarily uh, during the height of the COVID-19 uh, COVID last year, that interregional trade held its own. Uh, we, we uh, the bank, can um, attest to what is going on. Uh, in the past four years, we've lost about $20 billion uh, uh, in support of uh, intra-African trade. Uh, in fact, our intra-African trade division um, has consistently exceeded its targets, uh, far exceeded its targets. Of course, it, uh, it speaks to the dynamism of the team that is uh, running it, but also the opportunities uh, that are out there. So with regard to, to, to what is happening even before the FCFTA, uh, we, we are seeing greater interest in promoting the trade. So what the FCFTA will be doing now is to give it more impetus. Give it more impetus by making it easier through um, uh, tariff removals and also uh, with the work that is also being done to make sure that non-tariff barriers uh, go down. Now, uh, what has happened since January 1, uh, I'll tell you 
uh, that once when uh, two trade agreements are done, it takes a while for them to pick up. Uh, currently, as you may know, um, there are a number of protocols that are under uh, negotiations. Uh, there are the, the issue of the rules of origin, um, they are, they are all being finalized. And of course, most importantly, the, uh, the tariff offers and also uh, the service uh, offers. So exchange of tariff offers and exchange of service offers. So those are still going on. I think the, um, the FCO Secretary is working with uh, different um, the member state, the state parties, to make sure that all these are concluded before June July. Um, once these are concluded, then, of course, um, the, the customs um, of, uh, bodies of the different countries uh, will increasingly be prepared uh, to, uh, for the trade. Uh, and we then expect that gradually uh, we'll begin to see the benefits of the agreement. Uh, another thing we are doing that we believe will also um, help boost trade under the AFCFTA beyond what we already see is the adjustment facility. As you know, um, uh, the, uh, the members or the parties under the AFCFTA uh, are committing to uh, remove tariff, you know, 90% of the tariff lines. Now, for some countries on the continent, tariff revenue is a, an important source of fiscal revenue. For a few of them, Tariff is just a, a trade policy, so it's not a sort of uh, fiscal revenue. Uh, but for the countries that rely on tariff revenues for fiscal as source of fiscal revenue, uh, when you remove tariff and the uh, uh, trade structures change, their trade directions change, they may uh, suffer a significant fiscal revenue losses. So what the um, uh, the parties to the agreement have agreed is that an adjustment facility has to be in place. It will have a compensation window uh, uh, through which those eligible to receive compensation for tariff losses can be paid compensation. There are also other windows uh, to make uh, countries better prepared to participate effectively in the agreement. And the window also for the private sector to enable them to retool uh, their factories and to take advantage of, of the agreement. A present bank has been mandated by the African Union to work with the AU and the FCFTA, and of course the uh, FCFTA Council of Ministers, to put in place the adjustment facility. And I can tell you we've, we've made significant progress in developing the statutes and the resource mobilization plan. We expect that the adjustment facility uh, will require about $7.7 .7 billion. Our present bank board of directors has already approved our present bank support for that up to, up to an amount of $1 billion. And we expect uh, that upon completion, uh, the, there is an urgency um, uh, within the LCFA Secretariat and also the Council of Ministers to put this in place. We believe that we, before the end of the year, uh, that facility will be fully established and also help boost uh, intra-regional trade under the agreement. Definitely quite a lot of work uh, still to be done to get trade uh, to the level that we want on the continent. But thank you so much for the perspectives that you've shared today with us on the show today. That's Professor Benedict Dorama is the president of the Africa Export Import Bank. Thank you so much for joining us on this special today.